Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CFC. I'd like to invite you to stand up. If you're joining us from home, you can stand too. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Um, I would like you to pray with me as we begin to worship our Father. Father, we thank you for the, the gift that we have, Lord, to be together today. And Lord, would you now, would you ignite in us a sense of your presence, Lord, a, a sense of your, of your goodness, this, this realization, Lord, that your presence is good. Lord, this realization that, that your love is perfect and it is pure. And Lord, we thank you for the way you showed us your love through the sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, this morning, Lord, would you pray, we just pray that you would open our minds to that. Lord, open our hearts to that, what it means to love like you, to love sacrificially like you do. And we thank you for your faithful hand over our lives this morning. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Come on, church.
like to read this morning from Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord.
amen. Hey, before you sit down, would you say hello to at least eight or nine people somewhere around you this morning? are so, uh, so thankful that you're here this morning. Welcome to CFC. Hope uh, so far, if you're visiting this morning, that you've found this a welcoming place because we are really sincerely glad that you're here this morning. Um, something that we, we try to provide for everyone is it's called a Connect Card. Um, if you have a, a paper bulletin, it's on the back of that. If you found our bulletin uh, on our app or the website, you can fill it out there too. But it's, it's a place just to let us know that you're here. But it's also a place that lets us know if we can be praying for you. So I uh, just want to encourage you to fill that out this morning. Um, if you have some uh, little ones with you this morning, and uh, good cue, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you. Just led by the Spirit, I love it. Um, but if during the message this morning, uh, if your little one's having a hard time uh, focusing, um, and if you would uh, partake in the, the quiet rooms that we have, or we also have a really great um, children's ministry that we would love to minister to your kids. Uh, and know that we will be receiving an offering here uh, in just a, a couple of moments. And, and obviously, uh, we thank you for uh, your faithful giving to the ministries of, of, of CEFC. And that's part of what I want to talk about uh, next. If you've been around uh, CEFC long, you know that our desire is to minister to you here uh, in these, sort of, these four walls. But our desire also is to minister to people in our community. And uh, as we've been investing more and more time and resources over the last couple of years in serving uh, in our community and outside of our community, um, we wanted to make room. I'm sorry, I'm just going to be honest. I'm out of breath. So just make a. There we go. Okay. You know when you're trying to talk and you can't quite get your breath back? That was me. Good. All right. Now, I have oxygen and we will continue. Um, <laughs> so we've been talking to you the last several weeks about an initiative, and it's called O Less, So More. We want to owe less money to the bank so that we can sow more money uh, towards ministry. And we've asked you for the last several weeks to begin praying about what you might contribute. So what are you contributing to? Um, we have a, a second mortgage that we took out, or a mortgage that we took out on our children's building, our children's facility, uh, right across the way. And if you've been coming for many years, you know that that has been a wonderful facility to teach our kids the word of God and to, and to just bring Jesus into their lives. Well, we are so close to paying off that loan. We're about $375-ish thousand dollars away from paying that off. And the goal for this initiative, oh, less, so more, is to pay that 375 off because that will free up approximately $15,000 a month in, um, in resources that we have every month that we don't have currently. And we can take that money, we can invest it in our community, uh, in these four walls, outside these four walls, and across the world. So that's what we've been talking to you the last few weeks about. Um, many of you may have walked in and you had a, a commitment card uh, this morning, a little gray card that's about this big. Uh, there's also a QR code up on the screen. Uh, that you can focus on. We want to take a few minutes for you to pray and for you to say, hey, I, I, I want to pledge zero dollars. <laughs> I want to pledge five dollars or ten dollars or a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe you just pay the whole thing off and that's great. But again, the heart of this, the heart of this is just so that we can do more ministry. Amen? And so, and we, I, I don't even know what the current number is, but we actually shot over a hundred thousand dollars this past week of money that's already been given towards the 375. So praise God. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that you and your family have, have talked about this, but we want to take a, a minute or so. Um, the band's just going to play. Uh, I'm going to pray. The band is going to play. And, and during that time, if you would fill out that card or shoot the QR code and just let us know, hey, we're, we're able to commit this much money over the next year uh, towards the campaign. Uh, we would be so appreciative, and we will uh, do a whole lot more ministry together. So let me pray for our offering, for, for this time of, uh, of our pledges, and, uh, and then we'll sing here in a minute. I'll let you know when to sing. Father, we thank you so much uh, for your provision. We thank you. Lord, I'm thankful for the folks six years ago who gave uh, so that we could build uh, this building uh, that, that sits behind many of us, Lord, so that, that our kids could come. Lord, that they could hear your word. Lord, that they could experience your presence. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have now to enjoy uh, the acts of their faithfulness, Lord. And now, Lord, would you help us to to help uh, move that across the finish line so that we can be out of debt uh, in that area. Lord, would you bless uh, the giving of your people, Lord, as we receive our offering here in a moment as well. And Lord, we trust you in the mighty name of Jesus for everything we have. Amen.
worship our Lord.
is there anything that is too big to forgive? Of course, we can forgive small things, and all of us have forgiven things that are small, but is there anything that is so big that it's just, well, impossible to forgive, that it cannot be forgiven? Uh, if you think sort of on a, on a graduating scale, maybe you have gossip, slander, betrayal, murder, and I'm just wondering, is there anything that, that could be so big that you, you can't forgive it? Now, in your life and in my life, we've, we've all been wronged, we've been hurt, we've been harmed. And my question is, is, how have you responded to that? Have you responded in kind? Have you responded with anger? Have you responded by giving back to people whatever they have given to you? Or have you harbored deep inside that hurt? Or have you forgiven? How do you forgive the worst? I find that I struggle to forgive the person who drives too slow in the fast lane. How then can you forgive somebody who's done something of real harm? And that's really what I want to think about and look into the scriptures with you about today. Sometimes we experience sort of a, a long list of small infractions, offenses that become something of a mountain for us, and that's hard to forgive. But other times, there can be one event, a big event, that just feels unforgivable. Well, I want to tell you about a man named Stephen who experienced the worst and who also forgave the worst. Let me just give you a little bit of background, sort of catch you up on this person, Stephen. The apostles had been ministering to the people and they needed help and so they chose seven people and one of those seven was Stephen. They picked out from among them seven men, I'm reading from Acts 6 verse 3, men of good repute, listen to this, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Verse 5 says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, he was full of grace and of power and was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And his opponents argued with Stephen, but here's what they found. They could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So because they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit, they had to do something unconventional. Well, I suppose it's very conventional. What they had to do is they had to lie. And so they found men who they instigated to say that Stephen was uttering blasphemy. And these men became false witnesses. They seized him and they brought him before the court. Now, this is how people behave without Christ. They behave in a way that is brutal. They behave in a way that is filled with vitriol. And this ancient behavior that Stephen was experienced is also very modern behavior. You can watch the news and you'll see that today that people treat each other in ways that are absolutely evil. Watch the news and see what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. And how can you forgive when people are doing something so, so terrible, so evil? And if we would consider how people have treated you, you may be asking the question, well, how can I forgive this person given what they have done? But as I said to Stephen, they did the worst. First they slandered him, and then they murdered him, and yet Stephen forgave even as he was dying. I want to pray and ask that God would lead us through this passage. It's not easy to talk about forgiveness, and it's not easy to practice forgiveness without some supernatural help from God, and so would you join me, and we'll just we'll pray together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would lead us through this passage. We ask, Lord, that as we make our way through the passage, that you would you would bring us to Jesus, that through this passage about Stephen, that we would get a clear view of Christ himself and that we would be taught, not only by the example of Stephen, but by the example and the words of Christ that you would instruct us how to find forgiveness for ourselves and how to give forgiveness in the presence of God. And so, Lord, would you prepare us for this lesson which you have for us, that we might receive and give your forgiveness and experience your peace. Lord, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 6, we, we find Stephen contending with the crowds, and then they arrest him. They have the false witnesses. They slander him, and they bring him to court. And here Stephen gives what is recorded as, as a message, a sermon, and it's lengthy. It's his first recorded sermon and his last, because as Stephen is speaking, the people are growing more and more angry so angry that they decide to kill him. And why is that? Because Stephen is giving them a lesson 
on the history of Israel, not just the history of Israel, but the history of God's intervention and his care and his love for Israel, his love for the people of the world, and his sending of the righteous one, that is Jesus. And then Stephen just says very plainly, you have murdered the righteous one. And when they hear that, that just is too much. And so they move from slander to murder, and they begin to kill him. And that's where we pick up the passage this morning on Acts chapter 6, verse 54. I'd like you to follow along with me. And let's, let's listen to these dying words of a godly man who's full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 54. Now, when the people heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. I mean, what just an incredible description, sort of like an, an animal response. They ground their teeth at him. Um, verse 55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. We'll talk later about this young man named Saul. This is the man who is later called the Apostle Paul. Verse 59 and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And that means he, he died. So I want to talk about a path to forgiveness and looking at the example and the person of Stephen. And the first thing which I want you to notice about Stephen is the first step to forgiveness, and that is to be full of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven at the glory of God. Here is a man who is full of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that you are commanded to be full of the Holy Spirit? In Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. I would ask, are you full of the Holy Spirit today? Are you filled up with the Holy Spirit? Now, you may ask, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity, the triune God. He's part of the Godhead. We talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Stephen is filled up with this Holy Spirit who is God. And because he's filled up with the Spirit of God, he is able to do what he could not do before, and that is follow God. And that's true not only for Stephen, but it's true for you, and it's true for me, that apart from the Holy Spirit, we cannot completely follow God. We cannot fully follow God. That the Holy Spirit is a person who carries a power for us to do what we before could not do. And so before Stephen when he's seized, when he is lied about, when he's slandered, and when he's in the process of being murdered, he did not have the power, he did not have the capacity to forgive. And I want you just to notice the contrast between Stephen and the people. And really, this is the contrast between somebody who is full of the Spirit and somebody who is resisting the Spirit. There's a very big difference. The difference between the Christian who has the Holy Spirit and who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the crowds who are resisting the Holy Spirit is a very marked difference. There ought to be a huge difference in the way that people respond who know Jesus and those who don't. And we see it in the passage. If, if we were to look at Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Stephen is ending his sermon. Um, this is a way to end the sermon very abruptly. He says this, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And when they heard that, you know, the hope is, the prayer is that they would say, you're right, we have been resisting the Spirit. Let us receive the Spirit through faith in Jesus. But instead, they begin to feel enraged. How dare you say that we have resisted the Holy Spirit of God? And they're so enraged, the passage says that they're grinding their teeth. They're so angry, they don't even have words to speak. They're just furious with Stephen. That's the response of people who are resisting the Spirit. Instead of moving towards God, they're moving towards evil. And we'll see this today. 
We'll see today that when people are resisting the Spirit of God, they begin to move towards what is evil, and they give vent to their anger and their frustration. You'll find on social media that when people are allowing their inner anger to come out unrestricted, that it comes out in this grinding hatred, this, well, this act of resistance to God. But in Stephen, there's something very different. And I want you to notice this about Stephen, that he's full of the Holy Spirit, and because he is full of the Holy Spirit, he does not respond. He does not respond in the way that people have been treating him. Do you know that there is, among social scientists, what they call the law of reciprocity, which is just a fancy way of saying what everybody already knows, and that is people tend to treat others as they have been treated. You yell at me, I'm likely to yell back. You get angry with me, I'll get angry back at you. You want to speak behind my back, I'll speak behind your back. I mean, that's the law of reciprocity. That's the natural way, it's the fleshly way of behaving. And you feel that in yourself. You feel if somebody comes up to you and they shove you, the desire that you have is to shove them back. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, you might have a desire to cut them off back. And this is a natural response, it's a fleshly response. But what Stephen has is a spiritual response. It requires the Holy Spirit. Do you find that you're somebody who loses their temper rather quickly? Let me challenge you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, who gets the Holy Spirit? Who receives the Holy Spirit? Is it only people who are really good people? Is it theologians? Is it people who have been specially set aside, like Stephen was, for work in the kingdom of God? And the answer is no. Anyone may receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, everyone may receive the Holy Spirit, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. In Ephesians 1, we're told that if we believe in Christ, that we receive the Holy Spirit, and we are sealed with that Spirit. That Spirit becomes God's stamp of ownership upon us, and, and not just some sort of impersonal mark that God puts on us. It's His presence. It's His person, which He doesn't just lay on top of us, which He places inside of us, which is why Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit, not just covered with the Holy Spirit. It's from the inside that God is inhabiting His people like a temple, filling them with His Spirit so that they don't respond according to their flesh, but they respond according to the Spirit. You know, those who respond according to the flesh, Romans 8, 1 says, they cannot please God. It's impossible to please God. But those who are led by the Spirit of God, as Stephen is led by the Spirit of God, well, they can and they will please God. Full of the Holy Spirit, what does Stephen do? He doesn't respond by gnashing his teeth. He doesn't respond in anger and shouting. He does this. He lifts his gaze. I think that may be the hardest thing to do when you're being attacked, when people are shouting at you, when they're treating you unfairly. The hardest thing to do is to lift your eyes off of them, off of the offense, on off of the offender, and to put your eyes on Christ. Full of the Holy Spirit when people are grinding their teeth in anger. Haven't we been tempted to grind our teeth right back? Haven't we been tempted to fight fire with fire and anger with anger, but instead, full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen lifts up his gaze onto the glory of God. Can I ask this question of you? Where today is your gaze? I don't just mean your physical eyes. I'm talking about your mind. Where, where are your thoughts have you been nursing the, the, the injuries that you have received from other people? And I'm not saying you haven't. We've all been hurt before. I'm asking, is your gaze on what people have done to you, is your gaze on those who are opposed to you or full of the Holy Spirit, do you lift your gaze onto the glory of God? The first step, of course, is to be full of the Spirit. The second is to lift your gaze to the glory of God. Look, look again at verse 55. Full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I don't know exactly what he saw when he saw the glory of God. He doesn't give a, a, a full description of it. This, I think, is very similar to somebody who sees an amazing sunset and, and, and says, have you seen just the glory of the sunset? Well, how would you describe it? Well, it's, it's glorious. You, you, you can't give it an accurate description so that people could experience what you experience when you see the sunset. Or have you seen the majesty of the mountains? If you've gone to a mountain that's, that's magnificent and you, you can feel this mountain has sort of a presence to it and somebody would say, well, what was it like? You'd say, well, it's magnificent. It's a glorious mountain. 
but how would you describe it? No, Stephen can't describe it other than to say he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. If, if we want to forgive, we have to have a right perspective, especially if we want to forgive the worst. It's little things. Maybe you have strength and power enough to let go of them, but something big or a long list of things that have been piling up over time. You cannot forgive while you're still focused on it. You have to lift your eyes up and experience and see the glory of God. So hard to do when you're being mistreated. So hard to do when you are being slandered. But would you lift up your eyes and you would see if we looked up into heaven we would see not only the glory of God, but this is what we would see, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is a very interesting passage. Look, verse 55, he's standing at the right hand of God. In every other passage that is describing the presence of Jesus today, do you know what he's doing at the right hand of God? He's sitting. Yes, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, but this time, the only time, uh, Stephen looks up and he doesn't say, I see the glory of God and Jesus seated at the right hand of God. That would be consistent with all the other scripture. But he says, I see Jesus standing. Have you ever wondered, why is it that Jesus is standing? I believe Jesus is standing because Jesus is noticing what's happening he sees. We, we, whenever we read about a follower of God experiencing hardship and difficulty, do you know that the scripture says God sees, he hears. When Israel is in Egypt and they're suffering under the hardship of slavery, it says God hears the cries of his people. He sees the oppression. And here, as Stephen is, is experiencing this grinding of the teeth and slander, Jesus stands up. He sees it. He notices. He's not, he's not asleep in heaven. He's watching. He sees what's taking place. And when this happens, when one of his children is being mistreated, don't you see that Jesus stands up? If you're watching football today, which you might do, there, there could be a time where an unsportsmanlike play takes place Maybe the quarterback runs out of bounds, and while he's out of bounds, he gets crushed by one of the linemen. Out of bounds. It's, that's an unfair hit. What will happen to everybody who's seated on the sidelines? They will all stand up, every one of them. They, they notice this. They, they're alarmed at it. They, they want to do something. Jesus stands up. Stephen sees him standing. What do you think Jesus is doing? I'll tell you this. He could act at any moment. He's, he's prepared to defend his children but instead of acting, Jesus speaks to the Father, to Almighty God, to the judge of, of all the people that have ever lived. He's speaking on your behalf. That is the role of Christ. He is the interceder. He is the advocate. He's, he's like a lawyer, except that he is the son of the judge. And he stands up and he says, wait, don't you see what they're doing to my brother? He's speaking to God on your behalf. He's ready to receive Stephen. Jesus is not sitting back idly. He's not passive. He's active. And when Stephen's gaze looks up off of the affliction that he's experiencing in this life and sees the glory of God, he sees Jesus standing and advocating with God. Here's my prayer, Holy Spirit, fill us and fix our gaze above, above the fray. Above the fray. Do you remember the story of Peter when he's in the boat and they see Jesus walking on the water and, and they're terrified, they think it's a ghost and then Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter says, if it's you, tell me to walk to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he walks to Jesus on the water. I mean, it's, he's above the fray. It's, there's a storm, there's wind. And he walks to Jesus and then it says, he sees the wind. I mean, he's, his, his gaze, it, it comes down off of Christ and he sees the waves. And as soon as he sees the waves and as soon as he's, he's, he's gazing, now, here's a funny thing. You can't actually see the wind, can you? He sees the wind. What does that mean? It means his mind. His mind is on the opposition, and immediately he begins to sink. When we allow our gaze to drop below the horizon of heaven, we will begin to sink into the sea of bitterness, just like Peter. But don't you see, Jesus is standing, standing right there. He reaches out and he grabs Peter and he lifts him up. And today, as, as, as we are sinking into the bitterness, 
Don't you see that Jesus is reaching out his hands? He's saying, look up to me. And he grabs hold of us. Even right now, Jesus wants to hold on to you and lift you up. Lift up your gaze. Lift up your thoughts. Lift up your heart to focus on the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. Can I, do, I do need to say one thing, though. I feel like as a, as a point of clarification, I, I want to explain that while well, Stephen lifts up his eyes unto heaven, and that's the right response universally. One thing that, that this passage is not saying is that when somebody is mistreating you, you need to stay in the hurt. You need to stay in the environment where you're being punished or mistreated. And in fact, we see something very different. The only reason Stephen is staying here is because he's been seized. Um, it's not possible for him to escape, otherwise he would. And I'm saying this because the Apostle Paul does many times. Um, he escapes where people are trying to kill him. In fact, we read about this in Acts chapter 9, that there was a plot to murder Paul. And it says in um, Acts chapter 9, his disciples took him by night and led him through an opening in the wall of the city and lowered him down in a basket so that he could escape. It's, it's right to get away if you can. It's right to get away if you can. You can forgive from a distance. But whether you're in the middle of the offense, surrounded by offenders, or, or whether you have escaped to a safe place, the gaze from the power of the Holy Spirit needs to go up, off of the offender, off of the offense, and onto God. Christ is the one who is calling us to do this, to be full of the Holy Spirit. And then here comes the third thing. It's the most important, and it's the hardest, to pray and to actually say, I forgive. To say it, to pray it. That's what, that's what we see here in this passage with Stephen, verse 60. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I mean, what an incredible prayer. And what's happening to him while he prays that? Do you know? They're throwing rocks at him. I mean, he's, he's, he's being pelted with rocks as he prays this prayer, Lord, do not hold their sin against against them. He's on his knees in, in a posture of prayer. He's on his knees. This is not the prayer of somebody who's just walking through the motions sort of religiously. This is not the prayer of somebody who's saying, well, what I should be doing now if I want to be a good Christian is I ought to pray. This is because he's full of the Holy Spirit that he wants to pray even for his persecutors. And so there on his knees, he calls out in that loud voice, where did he learn that prayer, I wonder? Do you know? Where did Stephen learn to pray like that? from Jesus. Do you know this passage? When Jesus is hanging on the cross, after he has been slandered, while he is being murdered, with his hands pierced with nails, hanging on the cross, his life flowing out of him, Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm asking you this question. Would you fall on your knees today? Would you be willing to pray, Lord, forgive them, Forgive him. Forgive my mother. Forgive my father. Forgive my brother and my sister. Forgive the people at work. Forgive the people at school. Lord, forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. Jesus had a very famous sermon in Matthew chapter 5 where he speaks about forgiveness. With thousands of people gathered around, Jesus says this. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In other words, you've heard the law of reciprocity. If somebody loves you, love them back. If they hate you, you hate them back. You've heard that. But there's a contrast for those who have the Holy Spirit. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What is Jesus doing on the cross? He's praying for those who persecute him. What is Stephen doing? Well, he's falling on his knees. He's praying for those who persecute him. That's not an easy thing to do. In fact, it could be impossible apart from the Holy Spirit. And I, I know a, a man who's just a godly man, a good man. And I believe at one point in his life, he was hurt very badly. Because as we were talking about forgiveness, he, he, he made this insistence. He said, we only have to forgive people who ask for forgiveness. That's it. If people don't ask for forgiveness, you don't have to give it. And I, I don't think that was an academic position that he held. I believe that was a position he was holding because he had been hurt deeply. 
And the person who heard him had never apologized, had never said sorry. And he was, he was saying, I think I don't have to forgive unless they ask for forgiveness, unless they admit it, unless they acknowledge it and say, I've sinned against you. But do you see that that's not the teaching of Jesus? Pray for those who persecute you. Not pray for those who persecute you and admit their persecution. It's also the example of Jesus. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And not only is it the example of Jesus, it's the practice of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, like Stephen, whose life is, is ebbing away, prays, Lord, don't hold this against them. In Mark 11, Jesus says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. If you hold, what are you holding are you holding bitterness and unforgiveness? Forgive them so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. I noticed this very interesting point about Stephen. When he prays, he doesn't say, Lord, help me to forgive. How many times have I prayed that, Lord, help me to forgive this person who has offended me? Help me to forgive this person who has slandered me? I don't know. He does not pray that. He doesn't say, Lord, help me. The Lord has already helped him because he has given him the Holy Spirit. And I don't think either that you and I ought to, ought to waste Weeks and months and many of us, years and years and years praying, Lord, help me. And the Lord is saying to you, I have already helped you. I have given you the Holy Spirit. This idea, this thought that you should forgive somebody who has hurt you and who has not asked for forgiveness, that idea is not your idea. That is my idea. I have given you that idea from the Holy Spirit, and now it's time to do it. Now it's time to speak it, to say it. Now is not the time to say, help me. Now is the time to say, Father, forgive them. I wonder if you notice that Stephen is speaking not to his persecutors. He's not speaking to the people who are throwing rocks at him. He's speaking to Jesus. I find that so interesting. Your forgiveness ultimately is not between you and the person who hurt you. It's between you and the Lord. And so even though the people who hurt him are standing all around him, even though they're within a stone's throw, if you'll excuse the saying, even though they're that close to him, he's not speaking to them. He's speaking to Jesus, and he says, Lord, Jesus, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. When we forgive, we are not, we are not primarily working on a horizontal relationship. We're working on a vertical relationship, and we're handing over to God our right to take revenge. We're handing over to God the hurt which we have received. And we're saying, here, Lord, you, you take this and don't hold it against them. What is, what is unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is holding something which you should give to the Lord. Could you imagine a, a child that has found a poisonous snake? Maybe it's been given to them, and they're handling the poisonous snake. I mean, what's going to happen? The, the snake is going to bite them, and they're going to die. What should they do? They should hand it over, hand it to the Father. He will know what to do with it. And the same thing is true of, 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 this, of this offense which has happened to you, this sin which you have received. Don't hold it any longer. It will bite you. It will poison you. Give it to the Father. He knows exactly what to do with it. That's what forgiveness means. It means handing it over. How do we do it? Well, don't just intend to do it. Don't just think about doing it. Uh, we have an enemy who even now could be whispering to you, that's something you should do later. You know, like in a quiet place sometime um, down, down the road. Not yet. It's too fresh. It's too fresh. You can't do it now. It's impossible right now. You need time. You know, time heals all wounds, which is a lie. You need, you need time, and then you can forgive. You should intend to do it later. Just put it off. Procrastinate a little while. Don't do that. That's not forgiveness. Intending to forgive is not forgiveness. Asking God to help you to forgive over and over again is another form of procrastination. Just say it. Lord, don't hold this against them. Speak it. You can say it even when you're hurting. These are, this, when you pray, Lord, forgive them, you're not saying it, it doesn't hurt anymore. You're saying, Lord, I, this hurts a great deal. I would like to give it to you. And then praying, forgive them, don't hold this against them. That doesn't mean that God then immediately takes away the hurt and all of a sudden you feel no more pain. It doesn't mean that rocks now bounce off of you. No, you still are a human being. You will still hurt, but you will begin to experience peace. And in addition, the forgiveness of God yourself don't you see that Stephen forgives the worst, both slander and murder? This is an extreme example, isn't it? You may be surprised to learn this, but I personally have never been murdered. Never. Not even once. Never been murdered. 
I have been slandered several times, and I will say it's not easy to forgive. It's not easy. And some sins are impossible to forgive as long as your gaze stays on the offense and the offender. Be filled with the Spirit. Lift your gaze up and see the glory of God. And Jesus, he's standing at the right hand of God. He is your advocate speaking on your behalf. So you can say it. You can forgive. You should. In fact, you must. You are commanded. And then let me say, here's the last point. Then you can die in peace. Can you believe that? Yeah, that's where I'm going next is that you can die in peace, which is exactly what happens with Stephen, verse 59. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You see, he gives his hurt. He gives the sin which has been uh, afflicted on him. He gives that, and then he says, Lord, receive my spirit. And then the passage says, he fell asleep. You know, speaking about Jesus, it says that Jesus prayed a very similar prayer in Luke 23. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I think those are very interesting ways of describing death, and they're uncommon. He fell asleep. He breathed his last. What does that mean? Does that mean that the death was quick and painless? It does not. Think about the death of Jesus. His life is flowing out of him on the cross. He's hanging. It's a long and an excruciating death. And think about the death of, of Stephen. Was it quick? No. He, he is experiencing a slow and painful death. I think often when, when, when we're thinking about death, we say this, let it just be quick and painless. I hope that my death is quick and painless. God does not promise a quick and painless death, but what he offers is a peaceful death peaceful? How can that be? How, how, could, how could it be peaceful when people are throwing rocks at you? How could it be peaceful when you're hanging on a cross? And the only way that it could be peaceful is this, that you have forgiven. And so your hands are open. And since your eyes are up, you see the glory of God and you see the beauty of Jesus as one of the great hymns says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. You see his, his glory, his magnificence. Often we talk about Jesus as sort of meek and mild Jesus. But when you look in heaven, as he's described in heaven, he's radiant, he's powerful. And you're experiencing the injustice of this world. And often in this world, it does not appear that justice will come. But then you look up into heaven and there is the great judge, God, in his glory, in his righteousness, in his holiness, and in blazing glory next to him standing speaking on your behalf is Christ and so all of a sudden the concerns about justice in this life begin to ebb away because you know where you're going Stephen knows where he's going he's going into glory he's going he's going home to Christ and you know in heaven it says that there are, there is no more any pain no wonder Jesus has peace when he says Lord, receive my spirit. No wonder Stephen has peace when he says, receive my spirit, because in this life there's pain, and they're going home to glory where there is no pain, where there is no more gossip or slander or murder. What have people done to you? What hurt have they caused you? You can forgive them. Stephen had peace even in the teeth of death. And do you know that you can have peace today as well? You could have peace even in the face of slander or murder. You can have that peace through Jesus. Do you have it? Do you have peace today? Don't you see that God is offering you peace? He's saying, what are you holding? And if you, if you could see with spiritual eyes, you'd say, I'm holding this poisonous snake. And the Father is saying, give it to me and let me give you peace. Give it to me and let me give you peace. And put your mind on things above where Christ is at the right hand of God. That's Colossians 3. Put your faith, not in finding justice today, but put your faith and your hope in God, in the righteous judge. And then when we have fixed our gaze, our gaze on Jesus, don't you see it changes how we live today? We don't participate in the law of reciprocity anymore. We don't fight anger with anger. We, we, don't, we don't respond to shouting with shouting. We respond to the shouting and to anger and to slander and to gossip by lifting our gaze up into heaven at the glory of God. And we say, that's where we're going. And so it doesn't matter what people do to me. I have been 
filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been given the Holy Spirit. That's my promise. It's my, it's my seal guaranteeing that God is coming to take me to glory. Could you just imagine this picture with me? Maybe you could think about this life as a hard journey. It, it is a hard journey, isn't it? Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Imagine this life is a hard journey. You're walking through a cold night, and the wind is in your face. You're walking uphill against the wind. There's discouragement and opposition on every side, and you're plodding along, but you're not alone because the Spirit of God is with you, giving you strength for the journey and reminding you, even empowering you to lift up your gaze off of your feet and even off of every obstacle and opposition. And as you are lifting up your gaze, imagine that you see in front of you though in the dark of night you see a mansion and the door is open and the light and the warmth is streaming out and standing, standing in the doorway is Jesus welcoming you, welcoming you home to glory. And then if you can, if you can picture that, don't you know that you would forgive every suffering that took place along the journey? As Romans 8.18 says, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the Glory, the glory that shall be revealed. Which glory is that? The glory of God who is in heaven, where Christ is standing to receive us. And here's my prayer. May God fill us then with the Holy Spirit as we fix our eyes on the glory of God and as we forgive just as Christ has forgiven us. I would like to end by inviting you to pray with me. It's a prayer that Jesus taught us a prayer that he taught us to pray. Uh, he taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. But let me remind you that the, the prayer which Jesus teaches us to pray, it involves forgiveness, where we for, ask the Father to forgive us of our debts. That means that each one of us is a sinner who needs to be forgiven. But we don't stop there. We ask God not only to forgive us of our debts, but we say, as we forgive our debtors, that means the people who have sinned against us. May the Holy Spirit fill us, lift our eyes up onto the Father so that we can pray this prayer, so that we could say it, so that we could pray it to him out loud together. So I want to ask you, would you do that? We'll put the words on the screen. Would you pray this with me? You pray it out loud. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 As the worship team comes out to lead us in this, in this last song, I, I, I want to suggest to you that this time is the time for you to forgive. If you haven't done it, to do it now. As we're singing, as we're standing in the presence of God with the Holy Spirit, would you forgive? Would you just speak to, to Christ himself and say, Lord, don't hold that sin against them. Would you take what offense you have received and would you hand it over to your father? And perhaps you need some help with that. And so as we're, as we're singing, there'll be people who are standing up front and they're ready to pray with you. And maybe, maybe it's that you're not, you're not needing to, to forgive somebody. Maybe it's that you need to be forgiven. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you are the one, if you were honest, who has done wrong. Well, all of us have. And don't you see that if you pray, forgive us of our debts, that God says, I forgive you. I cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I wash you whiter than snow. I clothe you in the righteousness of my son, Jesus. I embrace you so that you are reassured of my great love for you. I want us to think about that while we sing. Would you stand with me and we'll join together and lift our voices in praise of Christ.
and even power to help us to forgive. So Lord, in this moment, we ask that you would empty ourselves of all but you. Lord, would you flood into every part of our soul? Lord, would you have access to every, the deepest reaches of the parts of our mind? Lord, and would you just speak your life? Father, I have to believe that there are those in the room who have been consumed by hurt and they have not been able to forgive. Lord, I would ask that you would show your compassion to them even in this moment. Lord, you would enable them to know that they are in your presence, Lord, that, that, that they are loved, that they are cherished, that they are forgiven. Lord, ask, Father, that you would speak your life over every part of us, Lord. Speak your forgiveness, Lord, that, that the, the words that would come out of our mouths, Lord, the meditations of our heart, Lord, every bit of it would be pleasing to you, would be filled with your life, would be filled with your life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, before you go, a couple of really quick announcements, and they're all important. You ready? Sportsman's Feast is coming very soon, and there are stick it, still tickets available. If you happen to be a hunter and you have extra venison uh, that you can donate for meatloaves, please uh, let the table know at the events booth. Um, child dedication is happening on the 26th, so hop online and you can sign up for that. Uh, there is a Next Steps class happening next Sunday, so you can sign up for that uh, and just come. And now I just say, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. Amen. If you'd like prayer, there's folks down front. We'd love to have you come, and we'll see you all next week.